Hello and welcome to the Business Standard Morning Show. I'm Ishan Gera and here are the stories for the day. Is bar Manali chalte? Nahi nahi. Goa. We Indians disagree on everything. But we agree, SBI is the banker to every Indian. SBI से tractor loan लिया, बाजी ये hundred percent सही किया. SBI is the banker to every Indian. The government-backed Open Network for Digital Commerce or ONDC was launched last week in select cities. Mentored by Nandan Nilikani, ONDC is a not-for-profit system which the government believes will be a game changer, just like what UPI was for digital payments. From small Kirana stores to leading FMCG players. all will get equal exposure to consumers on this platform but will it emerge as a challenger to two multinational giants who in the government's own words have been giving preferential treatment to a bunch of players in india and will it really benefit small sellers and the public at large our report offers some insight according to arvind gupta the head of digital india foundation A public platform is something that is built around the concept of openness, standard and trust. It is backed by the government and not by any private entity. There are about 9 platforms with billion plus users each across the world. 5 of them are in the US and 4 in China and none of them are government backed. With Aadhaar, India built the world's first and largest public digital platform. And now Nandan Nilekani, who helped the government create the biometric identification for almost 1.4 billion people after co-founding Infosys, believes that Open Network for Digital Commerce or ONDC meets all the criteria for the next revolution and disruption in India. It has the government's commitment, the market condition is ripe, and there is a massive shift to e-commerce after the pandemic. ONDC seeks to level the playing field for small merchants in the country's fragmented but fast-growing 1 trillion dollar retail market. While addressing a conference, Nilekani recently said that ONDC is very similar to National Payments Corporation of India or NPCI, which is also a non-profit section 8 company. The small-scale implementation of ONDC kicked off on Friday last week. This pilot is being conducted across Delhi, Bengaluru, Coimbatore, Bhopal and Shillong. It will be later launched in 100 cities over a period of 6 months. ONDC will set protocols in critical areas like price discovery, vendor match and cataloging, ostensibly in open source. So, you ideally get an open network with open specifications and protocols. Clearly, there's a lot of stress on the open part. India has a very large open source community which believes that in the digital economy certain digital infrastructure should be public goods and india being the other large country in the world after china though a much poorer country than china has a very large software service industry and a open source community now this community felt that we need to have a digital identity the recommended aadhar then they said we must have a india stack to make sure that financial services goes to the people upi came out of it and upi is you know possibly the best digital payment system in the world then they found that there is a problem about the large number of mom and shops and retailers here and they found that people like walmart was taken over flipkart amazon and maybe jio are creating digital monopolies in the world field so the jio model is very different and they felt how do we make sure that the you know likelihood of crowds of people who are mom and shop mom and pop shops are not destroyed although not everyone agrees on calling ondc a public good it is being said that these are public goods i think we need to remember that uh, ondc is a private company it is owned uh, by private players and so therefore the attempt is to replace two uh, uh, the the duopoly of amazon and flipkart with the monopoly of ondc we've seen a similar move in digital payments where npci um, which runs uh, upi which is india's largest payments protocol and payment service um, is also a private monopoly um, and has competed extremely well with mastercard and flipkart 
Um, let's not forget that NPCI actually contested the fact that they are not under RTI. So to call any of these entities, whether it is NPCI or it's ONDC as public goods or calling this public infrastructure would be factually incorrect because it's not owned by the government. It is not run by the government. It is not accountable to the government. Um, it is not accountable to the people of this country under, um, uh, under RTI. And um, as I mentioned earlier, this is also not open source. It's not open standards. All of this is in the service of one goal to change the e-commerce market's fundamental structure by moving from the current platform-centric model to an open network model. For instance, leather jacket seller Karan is only registered on Amazon. Meanwhile, Arjun, a prospective buyer who has heard of Karan's quality jackets, is registered on Flipkart alone. Arjun will first look for Karan on Flipkart. After failing to find him there, Arjun will have to register for an Amazon account. However, once ONDC is implemented, Arjun can directly purchase Karan's leather jackets without registering on Amazon. Why is this such a big deal though? There's no prohibition on Karan also registering as a Flipkart seller. Meanwhile, buyers shop across platforms as a matter of routine. With an account only on one e-commerce site, Arjun is probably an outlier. So, uh, what uh, such a mechanism allows is that it does allows you to do comparison shopping. Um, and there are sites available for that as well, where you can check the price of products across multiple platforms and you can buy from whichever platform. The thing is that most people end up going directly by default to either Flipkart or Amazon because they're used to buying from those platforms. So the challenge will be to create new apps and new services on top of all the information about these products, which is going to be available across, uh, I mean, via ONDC. Um, and then getting consumers to actually buy from that as opposed to buying from the apps and services that they're used to buying from. Clearly, the real benefit would come in the form of future offerings that could be built on top of this platform agnostic approach. And the work on that front has already started. About 150 retailers and five seller platforms are participating in the ONDC pilot. A buyer side application, Paytm, has been connected with the seller side app through the ONDC architecture. The consumer can use the Paytm app and place orders with the participating retailers. The number of both buyer side apps and retailers will increase as ONDC is scaled up. Also on board for the pilot is a logistics provider. As more logistics providers adopt the ONDC architecture in the future, consumers will have a greater choice of delivery partners. They should also answer a question many people have about ONDC. ONDC is not an application or a platform in itself. Once ONDC gets implemented, all e-commerce companies and online businesses in India will have to operate using the same processes and standards as in the case of Android-based mobile devices from different brands. According to reports, this could mean a complete revamp of systems for e-commerce players. They could end up losing control over their user interface and, even more importantly, consumer behavior insights. Basically, their competitive advantages. All of this amounts to a far-reaching and difficult reconfiguration. For the government to force all e-commerce sites to use a particular protocol, uh, would be anti-competitive in a sense. Uh, uh, they can't for it, and it would uh, it would deter innovation. Um, different sites operate in different ways. They are, they take different approaches to selling to customers. They don't necessarily take a protocol approach. So, if the government were to force all sites to adopt or adapt uh, this particular protocol under ONDC, I think it would be within their rights for. for e-commerce platforms to go to court. ONDC may also erode Amazon and Walmart-owned Flipkart's online domination, which has alarmed small merchants and the millions of Kirana stores that form India's retail backbone. The two global giants have captured 80% of India's online retail market with the help of aggressive discounts and promotion of preferred sellers. That's easier said than done though. Ask yourself, why do Amazon and Flipkart dominate the market? Well, both merchants and buyers flock to their platforms because of their tested technology. However, despite the challenges involved, the government's backing will give ONDC an outsized advantage. Using UPI 
where, where, where you know, there are millions of people and gross of people in UPI, tell them that you can download this ad and sell. And all you have to do is this, right? Or if you are on Amazon and Flipkart, you can transition from there and be on this platform too, so that more and more sellers come there. And as a buyer, you know, you are already on UPI, you're already with Aadhaar, they can easily send you a download and you can download the app and get onto the platform. Government can also say that we are willing to buy from people on this platform. If you, if you look at a parallel, right, uh, UPI had its moment in demonetization. Um, it had its moment when the Beam app was launched and the Prime Minister supported the Beam app and UPI. And he's continued to support Beam and UPI, even though these are essentially private uh, uh, entities and private services. Uh, perhaps it will require a governmental support and a government kind of push. Um, but also, let's not forget that like UPI, this will also need private partnership uh, and private uh, apps deployed um, by those who want to compete with Amazon and Flipkart. Last but not least, the question that ONDC needs to answer is, who will own the consumer data and who will have access to it? सब अच्छी दिख रही हैं यार कौन सी खरीदूं ये तो वही बात हुई 4000 शेयर्स लिस्टेड है कौन सा लूं वो तो सबसे आसान है तुझे 5 पैसा नहीं पता शह अब तो सबको पता है 5 पैसा पर है 4000 स्टॉक्स की रिसर्च टेक्निकल टूल्स और इन्वेस्टमेंट आइडियाज डाउनलोड 5 पैसा नाउ अब तो सबको पता है इन्वेस्टिंग मेड इजी एंड रिवॉर्डिंग विद 5 पैसा इन्वेस्टमेंट्स इन सिक्योरिटीज मार्केट आर सब्जेक्ट टू मार्केट रिस्क रीड ऑल द रिलेटेड डॉक्यूमेंट्स केयरफुली बिफोर इन्वेस्टिंग The country took yet another leap towards self-reliance last week when an aircraft made a successful landing using the indigenous navigation system called Gagan. With this, India became the first country in the Asia-Pacific region to achieve this feat. So what exactly is GPS-aided geo-augmented navigation or Gagan? How will it help aircrafts land safely in rough weather and in poor visibility? And how will it help India expand air connectivity to far-flung areas? Let us find out. The Airports Authority of India successfully conducted a light trial using the Gagan satellite navigation system for the landing of an ATR-72 aircraft belonging to Indigo at the Kishangarh Airport in Rajasthan last week. Gagan is a system jointly developed by the Airports Authority of India and the Indian Space Research Organization in collaboration with US defense contractor Raytheon at an estimated cost of 774 crore rupees. It provides a very accurate and high level of satellite signals for precision air navigation over the entire Indian airspace with the capability of expanding to nearby regions. It is capable of providing navigation services for departure, en route and landing operations to equipped planes. The DGCA had issued a mandate directing that all aircraft registered in India after July 1, 2021 to be fitted with Gagan equipment. Simply speaking, Gagan is a satellite-based augmentation system or SBAS, which is a regional network of ground stations and satellites that provide GPS signal corrections, giving a better position accuracy. GPS is the most prevalent global navigation satellite system or GNSS and is owned by the US government. Gagan is the fourth such SBAS system that has been operationalized after the USS WAAS, European Union's EGNOS and Japan's MSAS and it is interoperable with the other three. It consists of 15 Earth-based reference stations, two master control centers, three land uplink stations and three geostationary satellites. The reference stations gather GPS satellite data and the master control centers collect data from the reference stations and create GPS correction messages. Through this, errors caused by ionospheric disturbances, satellite orbit errors and inaccurate clocks are corrected. And through the uplink stations, the corrected messages are sent to the geostationary satellites, which then broadcast them to the aircraft. India is the first country in the Asia-Pacific region to trial indigenous SBAS for landing. Uh, this is a uh, satellite-based augmentation system with uh, LPV approaches, which is near 
precision approach, uh, which help airports not, uh, they don't require any separate navigation aids. They can get both the lateral as well as the azimuth, as well as the vertical guidance to land at the airport, uh, which means a single system uh, open, opening up a gateway for all the airports to have practically what's called even uh, low visibility procedures. Ground-based navigation system is already available in major airports. So none of them will be removed out of the system. It's a question of giving multiple opportunities. Suppose a ground-based augmentation or ground-based systems is not available at a particular given time or has gone on maintenance or something like that. Still a satellite-based system can function at that airport and allow your landings and takeoffs to take place safely. You will not expect it to uh, go for a diversion. So naturally, there's a fuel uh, uh, cost to it. Or operational efficiency will increase with the opportunity of landing or take or landing being carried out, which is a critical phase, even in under adverse conditions. Yeah. And second benefit is on all those smaller airports, we we'll talk about Udan airports, where which is naturally we are talking about cost effectiveness of the airport management itself. I we don't need to put the uh, costly navigation aids, and uh, they have got other restrictions, terrain restrictions, and others are there. So now, now one uh, one system like Gagan serves all these airports effectively. The advantage would be the cost of uh, the flight or cost of operations at Udan airports would be lower. But only thing is, in all these airports, there is a process which is which which is not a plug and play type of a mechanism. It needs training. It needs a procedure design to be tested, validated. Gagan needs a certain type of equipage. Older generation aircraft needs to be what you call retrofitted. Gagan will help airports which are currently devoid of precision approach capability equipment and have higher visibility requirements. It will reduce flight delays, save fuel and improve flight safety. Now aircraft will be able to land at airports not equipped with expensive instrument landing systems which include many small regional airports. At present, Indigo, Spicejet, Air India, GoFirst and AirAsia India have aircraft that are capable of carrying out these satellite-based procedures. As Gagan's footprint expands from Africa to Australia, India is in a position to offer its service to neighboring countries. Though primarily meant for aviation, Gagan's capabilities can be utilized in many other user segments such as intelligent transportation, maritime, highways, railways, surveying and the telecom industry. Gagan message service can relay alerts to deep sea fishermen, farmers and disaster affected people at the time of natural calamities. यार Let us turn to markets now. Geopolitical tensions, rising inflation, skewing margin of India Inc and slow growth rate are casting a shadow over Dalal Street. While April saw equity markets reverse losses from March lows, bears returned to street in the latter half. Will May see investors follow the adage sell in May and go away? What's our next report to know? Record high inflation and the growing hawkish tones of global central banks including the Reserve Bank of India has derailed recovery in the equity markets. The benchmark Sensex for instance had jumped about 15% from its March lows to hit a high of 60612 on April 4. However, the RBI's hawkish policy along with the US Fed chairman's hint at a 50 BPS rate hike in May weakened the bulls. Besides, persistent geopolitical tensions and lower than expected Q4 result of India Inc so far also dented the sentiment. Consequently, the benchmarks fell about 6% from their April highs and ended the previous month with a loss of 2.5% on a month-on-month -month basis. 
Now, as we head in May, the old adage of sell in May and go away is unsettling investors. To be sure, this saying has often proved true for the US and European markets. Data since 2010 shows Indian frontline indices have given positive returns on seven occasions in the month of May. Last year, Nifty 50 and S&P BSE Sensex rose 6.5% each during the period as global central banks continued with their dovish stance. However, the May of 2022 may be different. Global central banks are withdrawing liquidity and China is seeing its worst COVID outbreak yet. Analysts believe that if China, known as the factory of the world, continues with its zero-COVID policy, it will aggravate global supply chain disruptions further. Presently, the markets have turned excessively volatile, particularly in the mother market, the US. This excessive volatility is likely to continue uh, in this May also. In the US, a 2 percentage up move in one day followed by a 2 percentage down move in the next day and then again a 2 percentage up move in the third day. This kind of volatility has become very, very uh, commonplace now. Uh, this excessive volatility is because there are some very strong headwinds and equally strong uh, tailwinds for the market. The major headwind for the market is the expected aggressive tightening, monetary tightening by the Fed, expected in 2022 and even beyond. This context of monetary tightening is not conducive for a bull run in the equity markets, particularly when global growth is now weakening. Therefore, investors are not advised to buy aggressively in this volatile market because the volatility will continue there can be sharp uh, downswings in the market so it was it would be ideal to um, move some money into cash and wait for sharp downturns in the market and sharp downturns can be used to buy uh, high quality stocks in a calibrated manner Back home, indicators aren't favoring the bulls as well. Resurgence of COVID-19 and rising inflation are the immediate threats, while India's biggest initial public offer of LIC may bring short-term respite for investors, analysts caution that markets cannot be immune to the pain seen in global markets. Markets may follow the adage of sell in May and go away, as I believe uh, the LIC IPO could act as a catalyst for the same. Though the drain of liquidity is much less than earlier envisaged, still 21,000 crores will have an effect. The earnings season too is not very encouraging. This along with the rate hikes which could be as high as about 50 bips will ensure that the mood on the street is somber. It's advisable to remain liquid to an extent to utilize the opportunities at lower levels. Against this backdrop, technical charts indicate that the Sensex could move in a broad range of 54,500 to 60,500. Investors can expect significant support around 50,650-odd levels and resistance around 59,350. Nifty 50 is expected to move in the range of 16,200 to 18,300 with a support at 16,000 levels and resistance at 17,550. Meanwhile, investors will track Q4 report card of HDFC, Britannia Industries, Tata Consumer, Inox Leisure, Hero Motor Corp, Tata Steel, Titan Company and Tata Power in the holiday truncated week. They will also wait the launch of LIC's mega IPO due on Wednesday. Globally, US Federal Reserve and Bank of England will announce their interest rate decisions. Shares me trading. Do you know the file? Hey! Now you know everything. Five Paisa पर मिलते हैं research tools, portfolio analytics और investment ideas भी. Download Five Paisa now. अब तो सबको पता है. Investing made easy and rewarding with Five Paisa. Investments in securities market are subject to market risks. Read all the related documents carefully before investing.
May is also the month when the heat wave is almost brutal in northern India. The weatherman has now said that mercury will soar further this week and caution people against stepping out in the afternoon. But what exactly is a heat wave? Let us find out in our next report. A severe heat wave that is sweeping through large swathes of India has pushed temperatures beyond 45 degrees Celsius in several places in North and Central India. Heat waves have caused 24,223 deaths from 1992 to 2015 across the country as per official records. The India Meteorological Department qualitatively describes heat wave as a condition of air temperature which becomes fatal to the human body when exposed. Quantitatively, it is defined based on the temperature thresholds over a region in terms of actual temperature or its departure from normal. A heat wave is considered if the maximum temperature of an IMD weather station reaches at least 40 degrees or more for plains and at least 30 degrees or more for hilly regions. A 4.5 to 6.4 degree departure from normal is considered to declare a heat wave and a more than 6.4 degree departure for a severe heat wave. And when the maximum temperature is equal to or above 45 degrees Celsius, it is a heat wave, while if it is 47 degrees or above, it is a severe heat wave. The above criteria should be met at least in two stations in a meteorological subdivision for at least two consecutive days to declare a heat wave. Heat waves usually occur in the months of March to June and in some rare cases even in July. The peak month of the heat wave over India is May. Heat waves generally occur over plains of Northwest India, Central, East and North Peninsular India. It covers Punjab, Haryana, Delhi, Uttar Pradesh, Bihar, Jharkhand, West Bengal, Odisha, Madhya Pradesh, Rajasthan, Gujarat, parts of Maharashtra and Karnataka, Andhra Pradesh and Telangana. Sometimes it occurs over Tamil Nadu and Kerala also. However, maximum temperatures more than 45 degrees Celsius are observed mainly over Rajasthan and Vidarbha region. IMD's network of surface observatories covering the entire country measure various meteorological parameters like temperature, relative humidity, pressure, wind speed and direction, etc. Based on daily maximum temperature station data, climatology of maximum temperature is prepared for the period 1981 to 2010 to find out the normal maximum temperature of the day for a particular station. Thereafter, IMD declares a heat wave over the region as per its definition. The health impact of heat waves typically involves dehydration, heat cramps, heat exhaustion and heat stroke. The IMD uses four color codes for weather warnings. Green means no action needed, yellow refers to watch and stay updated, orange means be prepared, while red alert means take action. We Indians disagree on everything, but we agree. SBI is the banker to every Indian. SBI is the video KYC savings account. Finally, I agree. SBI is the banker to every Indian. But did you know that cold wave is far more lethal than heat wave? According to Down to Earth, cold wave claimed 76 times more lives than the heat wave in 2020. That's all for today. For more news and analysis, log on to businessstandard.com. We'll be back tomorrow with our next episode. Thank you for watching. If you like this video, share it and subscribe to Business Standard. For more news, views and insights, log on to www.business-standard.com. Do also follow us on YouTube, Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, Telegram and LinkedIn.